Le podcast sur la route de l'horreur est rendu possible grâce à Horreur Fanatique et son encan du samedi soir. Visitez horreurfanatique.ca pour plus de détails. Maintenant, bouclez votre ceinture puisqu'on vous amène sur la route de l'horreur. Cinquantième épisode de Sur la route de l'horreur. 1335 followers. Une émission de télé hyper populaire sur Pisson TV. Yes. C'est de la célébration aujourd'hui, mes amis. Félicitations, mais... Malade. Jasmine et Christophe, comment ça va? Hey. 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 Salut les zombies! Salut! Hey. Les hey. Eh oui! <rire> ça y est, c'est le cinquantième! C'est la oui, fête! N'oubliez pas! <rire> N'oubliez pas mes fans aussi, hein, parce qu'il ne faut pas les oublier. Ils sont de plus en plus nombreux face à leurs héros. Des fans Je vous des aime fans. tous. <rire> des fans ou des fans? C'est pas, pas clair. Pas Mais il faut dire, il y, y a quand même, y a quand même des, des, des très nombreux fans pour El Zomblar qui attendent oh, toujours sa joke à la ouais, fin de l'émission. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Hélas! Hey. On, non, non, mais on, on les aime, ces jokes, Colin, on les aime. Hey, écoutez, pour le 50e, on a décidé de faire ça en gros et d'aller chercher quand même quelqu'un de, 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 de connu dans le domaine de l'horreur qui a réalisé, entre autres, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Et je parle mm -hmm. ici de Tom McLaughlin. Hey, je ne sais pas ouais. comment tu le dis, Tom McLaughlin. Tom McLaughlin. McLaughlin. En tout cas, hey, euh, écoutez, Tom. on va l'appeler Tom. Ben, on va l'appeler Tom. Ouais, Tom. Puis, tu sais, c'est cool que tu as choisi euh, un, un réalisateur d'un Jason, parce que, tu sais, évidemment, Freddy a beaucoup de love. Hein, tu sais, nos invités, il aime Freddy. On le sait, les stats, là, tu sais, c'est clair que Freddy gagne là, le, haut la main. Mais, tu sais, Jason, on l'aime pareil, là. On l'a tout le temps aimé. Ben là, oui, c'est sûr, <rire> ça fait partie des icônes qu'on connaît très bien. Écoutez, je vais essayer ouais. le, le plus fort possible d'inviter Robert Englund à un moment donné pour parler de Freddy. Comme ça, tu sais, euh, on, 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 ah, on touche du bois hein, que ça arrive. Mais, euh... Ah, shit, c'est de la mélamine, je me suis trompé. Je ne mettrai pas ma main au feu! <rire> oh, c'est bon, c'est bon! Euh... Euh, je, je veux remercier Hors de Cinéma, par exemple, parce que c'est grâce à eux si j'ai réussi à avoir une entrevue avec Tom McLaughlin. Euh, Jean-Louis Colassi. Jean-Louis Colassi ouais, euh, et son partenaire, je ne me rappelle plus de son nom, puis je m'excuse sincèrement. Euh, si ce n'était pas de eux, je n'aurais jamais eu la chance de, de parler avec Tom, puis je vais vous dire pourquoi. Mais avant de vous dire pourquoi, je veux commencer avec vous autres, les gars, savoir c'est quoi, vous autres, votre top 3 des Friday the 13 euh, Quand On va commencer avec Christophe. Christophe, vas-y. Euh, c'est tough pareil. Il hein? y en a tellement. On... On les, aime, on les aime pour plein de raisons. Euh, moi, mon, mon préféré, puis euh, je pense que c'est quand il est devenu vraiment un zombie putréfié dans le set. Là. Le set, là, moi, j'ai vraiment une, une affection particulière pour le set parce que on a un genre de, de personnage, c'est Tina, je pense son nom, elle est comme une Carrie, le télékinésique, tout ça, avec son histoire avec son père qu'elle a tué malencontreusement par erreur, par, à cause de ses pouvoirs spéciaux. Mais, mais le, le Jason là-dedans est tellement beau. Là. On voit sa colonne, on voit ses os. J'ai une figurine comme ça. Il est encore dans une boîte. Il faudra que je sorte ça bientôt. Là. Mais il est, tellement, il est tellement cool. Puis il est lent. Puis là, il arrive avec la chaîne dans le cou. Mais tu sais, là, on a, on a Tom. Puis c'est pas ça à cause qu'on a Tom en entrevue, là, mais j'aime vraiment beaucoup le 6 aussi. Là, puis la figurine, j'avais acheté le 7 où tu peux comme l'accrocher puis là, il fait comme être dans l'eau. C'est malade avec la chaîne. Il y a beaucoup de monde qui mettent ça dans leur aquarium. Mais... Oui! <rire> mais, mais le 6, il est vraiment cool. C'est comme Frankenstein. Il, il, il se relève là, avec un éclair. C'est comme juste parfait. Oh! Tu as demandé mais... le top 3! Top 3? Je t'ai rendu à 2. Je t'ai rendu à 2. Top 3... 
Tu sais, le, le, un des, des, des meilleurs premiers, c'est le final chapter, le numéro 4, Corey Feldman. Euh, on a Tom Savini qui, qui revient aux effets spéciaux. Il y a des masques partout. Tu sais, la machette d'en face, là, tu sais, ah, c'est écœurant. Le 4, puis tu sais, mention spéciale, Jason X, parce que c est, c est, il est fait en métal. Là, c ouais. c est, c est, c est... <rire> là, on pourrait s'ostiner un petit peu plus là-dessus, par exemple. <rire> Jazz, toi, c'est quoi ton top 3? Ben, moi, mon top 3, en fait, j'y vais, euh, contrairement à peut-être vous autres, je suis pas un, je suis pas un gros fan fini, j'adore Jason, euh, mais euh, moi, j'y vais par expérience. Fait que pour moi, euh, ce qui fait mon top 3, euh, vendredi 13, 3D, euh, une expérience eh oui. que j'ai vécue avec Martin au, au Mayfair il y a déjà quelques années. On avait, avec des lunettes 3D, putain. Avec les ouais. lunettes 3D, ah. c'était euh, hallucinant. Écoute, quand, que, quand il lance le, le harpon, là, puis là, le, <rire> tu vois la corde, tu le vois glisser, mais ça vient là, directement dans ta face. C'est vrai, vrai, on voit la corde. <rire> on voit la corde, c'était magique. Um, à ça, par la suite, ben, Christophe en a parlé. Jason X, que, je veux dire, c'est un mal-aimé dans la ça, série, mais pourtant... Il y a ça un, devrait pas être bon, tu sais. Il reste qu'il y, y a un cult following, je crois, qui a été créé à l'entour de ce film-là. J'en fais partie. Uber Jason, euh, le masque en métal, euh, la, post, la posture de, de Kane Hodder, c'est imposant, c'est hallucinant. Um, puis à ça, euh, je ne sais pas si vous allez l'accepter, mais moi, je suis un gros, gros, gros fan fini de Freddy vs. Jason. Ben oui, on l'accepte, oui. c'est oh, oui, sûr, on l'accepte. Si tu m'avais dit ça, numéro 8, j'aurais été fâché, ouais. là, mais euh, Freddy vs. Jason, moi, parfait. Man. Moi, je vais rajouter Freddy vs. Jason. Il y a quelque chose de ce film-là qui vient me chercher. Évidemment, c'était la confrontation ouais. ultime entre deux, euh, deux icônes euh, d'horreur. Euh, le sang gique, la souhait oui. dans ce film-là, euh, je ne pouvais pas demander mieux. Puis quand je l'ai vu, je, je pense que je l'ai vu là, euh, dix, dix fois dans la même journée, là, si c'est possible. Alors... Quand, quand j'étais au cinéma et j'ai vu ouais. là, la première fois qu'ils sont arrivés là, un en face de l'autre, ouais. j'avais des frissons. Avec, avec le feu à l'entour de l'autre, oui. écoute, c'était magistral. C'est mon top 3, les boys. Ben, beau top 3. Bravo. Hey. Est-ce que j'ose inviter Zomblar pour nous dire son ben oui, invite-les. Bon, allez, je viens, je viens, je viens volontiers, pour une <rire> fois. <rire> euh, ben déjà, moi, je peux vous dire avant ça, le top 1 de Steve, c'est Jason Goes to Hell. <rire> il n'est pas là, on, on salue Steve. <rire> il n'est pas là, mais tout le monde le sait, c'est son ben top oui. 1. <rire> Non, mais pour moi, facile, un peu classique, malgré tout, mais euh, le premier, de, pour moi, ça sera le 6, qui est fantastique. Et puis, j'adore ouais. comment il revient à la vie déterré, avec euh, l'immense pieux en métal ouais. et puis un coup d'éclair. Ça, pour moi, c'est magnifique, c'est génial. C est, c est, il a donné comme accessoire, hein, c'est vraiment ouais, ça. Oui, oui, oui c'est ça. <rire> en deuxième, le 4. Parce que le 4, le 4 est fou, quoi. Enfin, c'est un gros, c'est un peu n'importe quoi, mais dans une bonne lignée. Et puis, comme tu disais tout à l'heure, Christophe, Corey Feldman, qui m'a toujours fait rire, ce gars. Ah oui. Et puis, ah oui. Tom Savini, qui revient en forme, quoi. Il y a plein de, de petites choses dedans qui sont sympas. Euh, pour le 3, ben, euh, j'y vais avec Jason X parce que les, les, les morts sont magnifiques. Et, et celui que je retiens principalement le plus, c'est la vrille avec euh, le cadavre qui est planté et qui tourne. Euh, <rire> alors ça, c'est mon préféré. Je pense là, même peut-être que c'est mon préféré suis... de toute la série au complet. Quoi. Je suis surpris que ce soit la drill ou euh, whatever que tu l'appelles qui t'impressionne le plus dans ouais. Jason X parce que moi le, le, la cryogénie là quand la fille ouais, ouais, c'est ouais. super aussi mais mais je trouve que tu vois euh, c'est des, des meurtres dans ce style tu sais on prend quelqu'un paf on le cogne tu sais ça fait c'est classique 
Par mais contre, la vraie, vrai. ça, tu le vois pas dans tous les films, ça. Non. La vraie, euh, tu... oh, ouais. même pas, tu as pensé avant, en fait. Et d'un coup, ça t'arrive en pleine face. Tu... Non, c'est pas vrai. <rire> eh ben oui, c'est vrai. Mais, vrai. Comme, mais, mais, comme, mais comme Martin disait, là, la face, puis la... tu sais, il n'y a plus de face après, là. C'est oh, comme juste comme. Fait... Mais oh, y a, y a, ouais. écoute, il y a tellement de meurtres classiques oui. dans, dans le défendre du ah, quand oui, il prend le lit qui est oui. crack. Oh, euh, ouais. Là, après, le, le sac de couchage. Troc, ouais. c'est magnifique. <rire> tu sais, il y a tellement Et de Kevin choses. Kevin Bacon avec la flèche. Oui, hein. avec la flèche ouais. qui est... Oh, c'est... Tout ça, c'est splendide. Freddy, ouais, ouais. c'est ridicule à côté. Ah Merci non, mais là, voir. par exemple, pas je savais qu'il n'était pas, pas fini quelque chose comme ça. Euh, <rire> moi, je vais y aller avec mon numéro 3, mon numéro 3. C'est drôle, hein, parce qu'il euh, y, y a plusieurs des Friday the 13 dans vos listes qui ressortent, évidemment, parce que c'est vrai que ce sont très bons films. Jason X, je suis un petit peu déçu. Dites-vous, les gars, là, je m'excuse. <rire> c'est pas grave. Hey, mon numéro 3, Friday the 13 The Final Chapter, euh, écoute, ce film-là est incroyable. Euh, j'ai écouté ça quand j'étais jeune. Euh, pour la première fois, je crois que j'étais chez ma cousine et j'en chiais dans mes culottes. J'en chiais dans mes culottes. Puis l'une des scènes qui m'a resté euh, imprégné dans la tête, c'est quand euh, l'autostoppeuse se fait transpercer la gorge euh, pendant qu'elle est en train de manger sa banane. Puis que sa banane, a coule en même temps. Comme il y a eu ah, ouais. <rire> Enfin, ça, je crois que c'est donc bien dégueulasse. Ça, puis l'infirmier, l'infirmier aussi qui se fait littéralement couper avec la scie à os, là, puis qui se fait tourner à la tête. J'ai ah, ouais. été traumatisé par ça, mais écoute, j'aime l'horreur, j'aime l'horreur. Parfait. Et le numéro 2, Friday the 13th, part 7, avec Carrie oh. dedans. Écoutez, quand j'ai vu la, la bande-annonce de Friday the 13th, part 7, pour la première fois, j'ai fait comme son tu malade. Ils ne vont pas faire ça. <rire> Voyons donc, c'est donc bien ridicule. Et quand j'ai regardé ah. le film, j'ai fait comme, ouais, c'était une excellente idée de mmh. faire quelque chose comme ça parce que c'est un super bon mashup. C'est original. Et, oui, ouais. c'est original. OK. Puis Jason X, c'est très original aussi. Mmh. Et c'est ce que je veux, moi. Je veux des Friday the 13 qui sont originales, qui sortent de, de, de la boîte euh, mmh. normale de Friday the 13 qui aillent chercher mmh. quelque chose d'original, dont le A. Ah, je veux, je veux vous le dire parce que peut-être que euh, les gens ne le savent pas, mais Tom McLaughlin a un projet de Friday the 13 sur lequel il travaille en ce moment. Je ne ah, vous ouais. dis pas c'est quoi. Écoutez l'entrevue, ah, on ah, en parle. Très cool. Hein. Et l'entrevue, je l'ai faite pour Art de cinéma et je n'ai pas hésité à dire oui, je vais la faire parce que Friday the 13 Part 6 est mon Vendredi 13 favori. C'est le premier Vendredi 13 que euh, Gabi a regardé parce que c'est le plus comique et le plus safe ouais. pour les ouais, enfants. Oui, c'est pas moi. trop gore. Il n'y a, a, a pas de, de nudité pas non plus. Ah, okay. Donc, euh, j'ai trouvé ah. ça fantastique. Donc, sans plus, euh, sans plus tarder, Christophe, donne-moi une, une petite bio, bio pour, de une petite Tom. Une petite bio pour Tom McLaughlin. Je pense que ça se prononce de même. On va l'appeler Tom, euh, qui est un acteur, un producteur, un scénariste, un réalisateur américain, qui est né euh, le 19 juillet 1950 à Los Angeles. Euh, avant de réaliser euh, Jason Lives en 86, il avait réalisé un long métrage en 82 qui s'appelait One Dark Night, euh, qui avait écrit et réalisé avec Meg Tilly, puis il y avait même Adam West, Batman de la série télé qui jouait là-dedans. Mais évidemment, tu sais, on le connaît pour Jason Lives. Il a travaillé beaucoup à la télé. Lui, là, depuis de, de 88 à 2010, dernière réalisation de 2010, je pense qu'il a pris sa retraite depuis. Euh, mais il a travaillé sur des, des, quand même des grosses séries. Tu sais, Amazing Story, je ne sais pas s'il y en a qui se rappellent de ça. En 86-87, c'était Spielberg. C'était la série Spielberg. Mick Garris travaillait là-dessus. Euh, Robert Zemeckis aussi. Euh, il a réalisé deux épisodes. Il a réalisé aussi un épisode de euh, Freddy's Nightmares. Il a réalisé aussi quatre épisodes de Friday the 13 The Series. Euh, que je n'ai jamais vu. Et qui n'a aucun rapport, aucun avec, rapport avec Jason, à part ah, le logo. Hein, et, et je ne je veux, veux pas te couper, mais euh, l'émission <coughs> française jouait à TQS. Euh, Ça pas le même titre. Hein? Peur Bleu, qui était la boutique au Maléfice. Ah ouais, non, avant Bleu Nuit, tu veux dire. Non, avant Peur Bleu. Ah, oh, le, le film. Vendredi le... So... Non, euh, il y avait, euh, tu te rappelles, il y avait Bleu Nuit, ouais. euh, qui était le samedi soir. Ouais. Et le vendredi, c'était Peur Bleu. 
Ah ouais? Il y avait Aucun des films d'horreur à toutes les, euh, les minuit. Ah, malade. Ouais. Avec la petite boutique des Maléfices en version française, il a aussi créé deux séries en 90-91, de bien occupé, She-Wolf of London et They Came from Outer Space. Et le créateur, writer, euh, producer, travaille là-dessus. Euh, il y a aussi le film tourné pour la télé, adapté d'une nouvelle de Stephen King qui s'appelait Sometimes They Come Back. Euh, qui n'était pas mauvais. Hein? Euh, il se passait des années 50, tout ça, avec des genres de, 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 de démons euh, louches. Puis après ça, il y a quand même... Euh, il a pas travaillé dans le genre. T'sais, il a travaillé beaucoup à la télé. Il a fait plein d'affaires, des petits drames, des, des, des trucs euh, moins intéressants pour les fans d'horreur. Mais en 2017, il a collaboré à Friday the 13 The Game, le, le jeu vidéo. Ah, il a euh, écrit euh, les textes des euh, Pamela Tapes, dans le jeu, tu peux collectionner, trouver des cassettes vidéo, euh, des cassettes audio, pardon, puis euh, tu écoutes euh, ben Pamela, hein, la maman de Jason, puis euh, euh, tu, tu découvres du backstory, puis c'est lui qui a écrit ça. C'est quand même cool qu'il est comme full circle, il, ben, il revient à, à Jason par la, par la porte d'en arrière avec ce jeu vidéo-là qui est quand même assez cool, puis il a été dans un fan film en 2020, mais ça, je ne sais pas si ça vaut la peine d'en parler. Fait que, voilà pour la petite bio de de Tom McLaughlin. Puis, euh, ben, euh, on, on vous laisse avec l'entrevue de Martin. Puis, euh, j'ai bien hâte de voir ça. Merci. Amusez-vous bien. Well, I gotta say thank you very much to be here with us because it's, it's really an honor for me and I'm sure it is for Jean-Louis and Najar also because, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound a little bit uh, fanny boy, but Jason Lives is my favorite Friday the 13th of all time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. You're welcome. <laughs> well, let's start uh, with the first question. And I know you're a big, uh, big uh, musician. So uh, how did you start your career in music? Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I was a big musician. COVID has certainly, you know, killed all of us oh, being yeah. able to get out there and perform. Although I did a horror convention um, in uh, New Jersey, and in, in, you know, like I don't know, three months ago or four months ago, and you know there was a band there, and I got up on stage and sang Monster Mash and uh, the Man Behind the Mask, and that was the you know first time in almost two years that I had a chance to get up there and do what I love to do, but. Um, my background really was um, my father was a magician and a fire eater, and he was in the original Nightmare uh, Alley. I know, you know, Guillermo just re you know released a new one, but yeah, he was uh, in like the opening scene, and he he also taught me to love movies. Where I couldn't say taught me, but shared with me, and that's what I wanted to do. And then come about '62, the Beatles hit. And if you wanted to have a girlfriend, you had to grow your hair and you had to pick up an <laughs> instrument. So, um, yeah, from the time I was, I guess, you know, 12, 13, all the way till I was 19, when I left to go work with uh, Marcel Marceau in Paris, it was all rock and roll. And um, that's, you know, what I was going to do. I was going to be a rock star, period. Um, and... Then when I started learning mime, I began to realize, no, I can do visual comedy. That led me to, you know, wanting to do visual cinema. So my production company is called Cinemim. And, you know, with that, that whole idea of visual cinema. And, uh, you know, then jumped all the way to 10 years ago, a song that we recorded with the Sloss in 1965 kind of just disappeared. I mean, we, it never played anywhere. It was called Making Love. So you couldn't play it on the radio. That was too, you know, controversial of a, of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> But it turned out that there were people that, that found it and played it in Europe. So we didn't realize that we kind of had a, a cult following in Europe from this garage band, you know, song. Yeah, because And, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the slots will open many concerts like The Doors, Pink Floyd, and many others, right? Oh, yeah. But remember, we were like 15, 16-year-old kids. And, but in those days, if you had hair, if you can play, you know, kind of 
English rock and roll or pretty much any kind of rock and roll. And we were sort of early punk, in, you know, and I was also very Alice Cooper in my presentation of blowing things up and stabbing myself and doing all this kind of pre-Alice Cooper stuff um, that we got, you know, a lot of kind of notoriety for being a show band. And as I said, that you know, the, the song just wasn't going to go anywhere, but somebody found it because it sold on eBay for $6,650 because it was so rare, the 45. And somebody in a, a music publication company, you know, started doing some homework. They found our guitarist. He hired a detective, found the rest of us. I wasn't that hard to find, but um, some of the other guys, you know, were off, were plumbers, were lawyers. <laughs> so we all got back together again 10 years ago, and we began to do what we haven't done in 45 years. So it was an incredible resurgence with doing music videos, and we did an album on vinyl, and, you know, we started to tour, and, you know, we, uh, we had... A lot going on and then COVID went bloop, and that was that. So now now we kind of, I don't know what's going to happen with the band. I'm kind of working on some new ideas for a new kind of band at the moment. And you also uh, made some music for the movie uh, The Mintzville Murders, right? Yes, that was the, it took one of the Sloth songs called Haunted and that, and they used that in the movie and they, I think they just used that song also in, um, 13 Fanboy, um, the Deborah Voorhees yeah. uh, directed movie with all the kind of alumni from Friday the 13th in there. Uh, she was very clever what she did because she didn't call it a Friday the 13th or Jason movie, but it, you know, that's what it is. I mean, that's what you want to see of all those people and, you know, sort of, sort of a, a faceless killer. So she's, she was very, very wise in, you know, doing that. So COVID is stopping you from making more music or at least traveling with the band and everything. Do you, do you actually intend to go back on the stage with the group? Yes. Uh, well, the question is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm 70 going on 17. I mean, I have not <laughs> let go of being a teenager. I don't, for some reason I can't. Um, and one of the things that motivates me is I bought a crypt at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery where I shot my first movie, One Dark Night. And I said, okay, 30 years from now, I'm going to be in there. So now I have 30 years to do something great. So I have been, you know, like a crazy man, you know, writing, trying to, you know, find other things. As I said, I, I formed basically two other bands um, that as soon as, you know, I mean, we can rehearse. The Sloths are older guys. I mean, they're 70 going on 90. And so they're sort of going, well, I don't know if I want to. And I go, God, dudes, let's do it. You know, and it's like, eh. so I'm sort of going, well, we'll see <laughs> You know, if an offer comes along, maybe. But me, um, I created a band called Horror Rocks. And Horror Rocks, that's R-O-X-X, -X, is basically songs from only horror movies since the 1950s. Uh, till now. So everything from, you know, Sympathy for the Devil to Killer Clowns from Outer Space to, of course, Man Behind the Mask. I mean, there's a, there's probably maybe like 50 songs, guys, that all you hear them and you go, oh, yeah, 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 I know that song. And if you're a horror fan, you go, oh, you know what that's in? So to me, it was like the, you know, the perfect kind of band, you know, to be able to go out there and do the horror conventions travel because it's also, you know, popular songs, you know, ACDC songs. I mean, so many things. So that, that I've been working on, but again, we can't go out there until the restrictions, you know, end. Yeah. Because, uh, you are in the States, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in basically Los Angeles. Yeah. It's, uh, getting out of control over there. I saw it. It is. Uh, you know, I, you know, I have been shot up. So <laughs> <laughs> it's your fifth I, shot or something <laughs> uh, coming back to one dark night, your first yeah. horror movie, uh, mm -hmm. a little later, you will, uh, you directed Friday the 13th part six. How was the movie born? Uh, the first one, the sixth one. Oh, part six. Yep. Okay. Um, what happened was, is that, as you probably know, Jason 
was killed in part four. Part five, they decided, well, we did so much money on part four, you know, we got to do a part five, so a new beginning. And for some not very smart reason, they decided, well, we'll have Jason killing, but it won't actually be Jason. And then at the end, Tommy will put on the mask and stare and we'll make it seem like, hey, maybe Tommy is going to be the next Jason. Well, the fans were like, no, say, stop, stop, uh-uh, no. And, you know, it, it really created quite a, you know, big deal. And they saw how, how there was such a backlash that normally a Friday the 13th comes out every two years in those days. Now, in one year, they said, we got to get <laughs> our audience back and we got to let them know that, you know, Jason is back. So they saw my One Dark Night and they liked that it was very kind of gothic horror. And if you've seen One Dark Night, it was, the inspiration was going down into the catacombs in, in Paris and feeling what it was like to be wall to wall dead people. And that kind of inspired this. So how could I modernize that? And doing it in a mausoleum was what I came up with. So uh, Frank Bancuso Jr., who was the, the son of who ran Paramount and was in charge of the Friday films, he said, you know, would you want to do this? And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, bring back Jason. And I go, okay, what about story? I don't care. Anything else you want to do, just bring him back. And I said, let me think about it. So I went off and actually went to the cemetery, which one day I will, I will be living in or <laughs> laying in. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I wrote this whole, you know, story um, about Tommy, you know, continuing on. I sort of made like five didn't really happen, although he is leaving a, a, a mental institution. So, you know, you could accept five or you could just say, you know, he was dead from when, you know, the boy Tommy killed him. And I added comedy and I didn't know if they would be okay with that, that I sort of said, I want, I want to like the characters. I want this to be a movie first, you know, and a, and a slasher film second. And I want to kill as many guys as I do girls. But the big thing is I want every kill to be something a human being can't do. Only Jason can punch a heart out, you know, cut off three heads, twist one and pull it off. I mean, so I just tried to make everything, you know, bigger, bigger than life. And they said, we love it, go. And I was, I was off and had, you know, almost total creative freedom. The only thing they asked me to take out was I introduced Jason's father at the end of the film. And he said, no, if we do that, there are going to be people thinking, oh, part seven is going to be Jason's dad. We don't want, so I had to take that out. So other than that, you know, the, the movie is what, you know, I wanted the movie to be. So campers, Jason Live is the first movie to showcase actual paying campers. Uh -huh. uh, usually the series is typically about camp counselors who get hacked before the kitties arrive. So right. speaking of which, having children in this movie made it so much more scarier. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have to be like extra cautious working with children on a film uh, of this subject matter? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. The reason it hasn't happened and it doesn't happen, you know, in a lot of films is that there are such strict rules and regulations of having a, a kid on a, a movie set. There has to be a, a, a studio teacher because they have to stop and, and have school, you know, for a, a certain amount of hours every day. They only have limited hours. I mean, um, you know, I was dealing with kids who were supposed to look like 10 and 12, and they could only be shooting like five, six, seven hours at the most. And I was doing all nights, which means that, you know, I was going to be doing scenes with these kids at five in the morning, you know, and I didn't know if they were going to, you know, go along with that. But much to my shock down in Georgia, where we shot it, the parents were all Friday the 13th and horror fans. <laughs> so, you know, it was like, no, my boy, he's fine. You just know, you know, he'll go, he'll go till noon. You know, you can so I had all these very supportive parents who just allowed the kids, you know, to be up. I was very respectful, you know, of them because I love kids. And, and this was a big thing for me is to be able to actually have, you know, children in there and have a little girl that was kind of representative of, you know, the child with, you know, the monster and the monster under the bed and things. And, you know, I, I had some plans to do something with that storyline later, 
which hopefully one day I'll get to do. But yeah, it was it it was difficult. But as you say, so many people have said, now I'm really scared. And the other bonus that I didn't think about was all these years later that these these kids see the, saw the movie on on VHS or DVD or streaming. They saw them when they were kids themselves. So they identified with those little kids. Now, when I see them at conventions, they go, I have seen your movie a hundred times. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it just scared the shit out of me, but I love that, you know? And I mean, it's a whole generation that has all these 80s movies. You know, guys, I we all thought, you know, the the Halloween people, the, the Freddy people, the, you know, uh, obviously Jason, um, Michael you know, Myers, you know, yeah, you know, Hellraiser. Uh, all, all of us thought we were kind of doing just junk that would go into the theaters, play maybe two weeks, and then be forgotten. Um, but obviously, with the advent of you know cable and DVD and VHS and stuff, it just grew and grew. And you know, now it's like like Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman were to me growing up. You know, these are the iconic monsters, you know, for, you know, generation after generation. Yeah. Yeah, I truly agree. So uh, as a young director, was it difficult to tackle a franchise like Friday the 13th and to uh, direct a chapter of it? It, it wasn't difficult in that um, I, I didn't have any creative interference, which was really an incredible blessing because I could kind of make the movie I wanted to make, except the budget was going to be very, very tight. And I had very ambitious ideas compared to a guy in a mask with a knife and girls and, and, you know, naked and kill them after they have sex. And that's it. You know, I had a car chase. I had an underwater fight. You know, I had the, the motor home that, you know, crashed. I mean, I put, you know, children, I mean, so many elements that you really couldn't do for that amount of money, but I found a way to do it. So from that standpoint, it was, a great challenge and we had a family and here we are 35 years later all these people i still am in touch with we're all very close you know we we you know are on each other's instagrams and facebooks you know always in con constant con you know communication and of course we see our, each other at the festivals uh or in the conventions and things that we do so it really you know i mean part of it was the movie has been an enormous success Uh, which none of us expected, but it also, we really bonded. We all really had fun as we were making it. And I've done 42 feature films. And out of the 42, when somebody says, well, what was the most fun? It's like this one, <laughs> this I one really you. had fun. And it sort of showed on the screen, I guess, you know, that we were enjoying what we were doing. Which brings me to something else. And uh, since you've been very creative with uh, Jason Lives, you... I know, I already know the answer to this, but I want people to know about it. The opening scene, James Bond style. Why? <laughs> All right. Two reasons. One, when I was 12 years old, my father, you know, by this point, that's when I was kind of moving away from magic, which I was doing for him. And also I was shooting films. Uh, he gave me his camera equipment from when he was at USC as a filmmaker. So I was shooting in the back lots of MGM studios, making my little movies with my friends. Now I'm suddenly going off into rock and roll and our bond was beginning to break because <laughs> nobody, especially an older generation could understand the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or, you know, what is going on. And for guys, it was like, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. So my father said, why don't we go to a movie together like we used to? And the movie we went and saw was Dr. No. And of course, he went crazy for Ursula Andress, you know, and thought the movie was great. And of course, I went James Bond. Oh, my God. You know, so that that had a huge like impact, you know, at that point on me that never went away. I'm, you know, a huge Sean Connery fan um, and, you know, um, Daniel Craig, I like, you know, very much in a second position. I wasn't crazy about Roger Moore and some of the other ones, yeah. but, you know, there was that influence, but even more than that was I'm going, well, we're doing a sixth uh, in a series of films. There had not really been a franchise 
of a number of movies other than the James Bond ones. Uh, so I thought, why not set the movie out and say, look, here we go, part six. I'm going to, you know, do tribute to the, you know, to the big franchise that we have, Mr. Bond, but turn it into Mr. Voorhees. And so that was what, you know, you know, came out of it. And I wanted people to, if you laughed at that and went, okay, I get it. The rest of the movie, you know, we can really kind of have fun with it as well as try to have the, you know, the scares and, and things. But I, I really wanted people to know that I was doing this, you know, with a sense of fun. So at the risk of sounding like a fanboy, Jason Lives is my favorite Friday the 13th and is also one of my favorite horror movie of all time. Oh, wow. Uh, no, no, seriously. I became a huge horror fan when I was still very young, definitely too young to be watching them, but my parents didn't really care what I watched as long as it wasn't too extreme. So I was able to see Jason Lives at my hometown's theater because, let's face it, Jason Lives is actually the less serious of them all. Well, yeah. maybe not if we go into Jason X. <laughs> Why did you go with a less serious story? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 my intention was, as I said, to make a movie that had a, an actual arc, you know, and a structure <laughs> so that the lead character, Tommy, goes in, all he wants to do is almost like Fritz in, in the um, Bride of Frankenstein in the beginning, you know, he wants to go down and, and make sure that the, the monster is dead. You know, I want to see his black and bone. So I kind of took that idea as I took Frankenstein's for the resurrection with the, the lightning. I mean, that's a complete, you know, steal from, from yeah. Frankenstein. And I wanted it to be that and even had a store that said Karloff's, you know, market so that everybody knows, you know, I'm, you know, paying tribute to the these. So, so basically, you know, you know, I, I wanted Tommy to screw up you know, and what he did, and he causes Jason now to come back stronger than ever. So through the whole movie, he's got to figure a way, you know, to fix this <laughs> that he did. <laughs> that drives him, it pulls him into Megan, you know, all the way down the line. And then, of course, you know, kind of in classic tradition, you know, the guy almost gets there, but then the girl comes in and, you know, and, and helps him, you know, to, to, to get Jason. And then Jason, he was fine being down there he didn't need to <laughs> come back to life and he's gonna go after the guy who did this i mean all the great monsters you know you know dracula you know bella lugosi said you know to be dead to be really dead must be glorious and frankenstein you know love dead hate living there always was that regret that they were what they were and i thought well this is a way to basically say i'm going after this guy anybody in my way goes down and so that was sort of the, you know, the thing that, that kind of, kind of pushed the story along. So it wasn't just random kills, you know, it really was, you know, I think other than him seeing the motor home and going, what the hell is that? And going in, <laughs> <laughs> gets distracted, you know, the rest of it were things that got in his way or people that got in his face, you know? Um, so, and that, that's the thing is you don't get in his face and, and choose him off, you know, with a gun. Or anything. Well, let's face it, uh, that's not only the only reason. I mean, he probably was a little bit pissed off at Tommy for killing him so much. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. So we're, talk we're talking about Jason Voorhees, uh, that is played by C.G. Graham. How did you meet him? That also was a kind of an interesting story. Um, what they do on these Friday the 13th, or have been doing, is that they'll hire a stunt man so he can basically do all the stunts and coordinate with the actors you know how to do these things and then they would play jason so you know that was kind of the case through you know almost all all the movies and when we got to ours it was the same thing um you know cj was my second choice what paramount would prefer is if i went with this guy dan bradley you know, who was a much kind of bigger, bigger, bulkier kind of guy, really nice guy, great stunt coordinator. And um, so we started shooting. And in fact, all the daytime stuff that you see with the paintball and all that, that's not CJ, that's actually Dan Bradley. And if you mm -hmm. look, you kind of see, you know, the shoulders are a little more slumped and he's a little bit, you know, bigger around the, the center. But when Paramount and Frank got the first daily, the rushes, they went, 
he looks like he's just like, you know, getting way too fat, you know, and, and we, you know, we don't want Jason to look fat. And he called his sister, who was the costume designer and said, what are you doing? And she goes, I keep take, I can't take any more seams out. I got the, <laughs> the biggest shirt on him and stuff. And they called me, you know, and said, we're making a change. I said, what do you mean? And he goes, we're your second choice. You still like him? And I go, yeah, but why? And they go, we're making a change. And so I never even got to say goodbye to Dan Bradley. It was like, boom, he was on oh. a plane and back, you know, in, you know, in comes CJ. Now it really was a two-way blessing. Dan Bradley now is the biggest, the richest second unit director. You know, he did all the Bond films, you know, the, the, the Daniel Craig ones. And I think even before that, all the born identity films, he does all those stunts, all that stuff is in charge of all those units. So he's fine. You know, he don't need the hot Good on him. Yeah. <laughs> CJ came in and he had no experience, but he was a Marine. And he followed everything I said to the letter. He did all the stunts himself. And he was just the nicest, still is. And, and had that sort of, what I wanted more actually, was that sense that he had been electrified. So he moves a little Terminator-esque. And having studied mine, you know, I'd, I'd make sure his movements, you know, had that kind of... I was about to ask the question. So your work as a mime and stuntman actually yeah. helped identify CJ, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Because, you know, as, as you might know, I mean, I did a lot of stuff in costumes and, and things, you know, the Jabberwocky, Captain Star and the Black Hole, uh, uh, you know, the, just, you know, the, the mutated bear and prophecy. I mean, so I got used to sort of taking that ability and doing, you know, horror movies or sci-fi movies, you know, with it. So directing, yeah, I was always brought in to, you know, coordinate things because of, again, my, my skill like a stunt coordinator. Yeah. Uh, contrary to the fifth part, which includes a lot of nudity, your film does not include any nude scenes, Friday the 13th, Chapter 6. It is different, once again, from the other films of the franchise. Uh, were you censored for Friday the 13th? Not at all. You know what happened? <laughs> if you if you read the script, that scene with with Nikki and Court, she is topless uh, in that scene. So there was you know the mandatory pair of breasts, which you know I certainly didn't really have any problem with, and nobody else does. Um, but when we were about to shoot the scene, Darcy, the actress, said, "Do you really need this?" And I said, "What do you mean? Do I need it?" And she goes. I I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable doing it. I mean, I have done things like this in the past, but I, I really don't want to be known as the girl that comes and takes her top off. And, you know, obviously things like that, it happened like, cause I work with Phoebe Cates and she so regrets doing that scene oh. and fast times at Ridgemont high, because every other thing after that, other than my movie that she did with me, you know, she was asked to take her top off. So I said to Darcy, you know what? just because this is the cliche, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? I think the comedy will play better if we're watching the joke and not like watching the nipples bouncing. You know? <laughs> That's what I'd be looking at. I totally missed the joke. So it kind of worked in our benefit. And recently I did a photo shoot with her. And I don't know, I, I should send you the picture, but it's, it's a shot of us in a motor home. I'm on top of her topless you know, like this, you know, and she's laying be below me and Jason's looking through the window. So I've gotten so much flack about, you know, dude, why didn't you, you know, show us the tits? I said, you know, sorry, you want to see tits? Here you go. All right. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, know, actually, it kind of be controversial in, in its own way. <laughs> I'm actually glad you didn't because uh, my my daughter is uh, eight years old and she's a huge fan of horror. She started watching horror films like uh, Universal Monsters when she was four years old and she loves it. So I was like, okay, I have to show her Friday the 13th at one point and she wanted to see something like right away, but I was a little bit reticent because it's Friday the 13th. And the first one I showed her was Jason Lives because it's funny and it doesn't contain any nudity. So she's a big fan now. <laughs> you know, so, it, it, as many people have said to me over the years, which is kind of funny, it's sort of like, you know, when you're trying to tell your kids, you know, not to take drugs. And there's always that thing of when they start to want to experiment, usually the entry level is marijuana. 
you know, they, you know, and then, I mean, this is what happened to me as a teenager. It's like, okay, now you got to take this. What's this? Just take it, you know? And the next thing you know, you're into psychedelics. And then some of my friends went all the way into heroin and, oh, and shooting cocaine and stuff. And that's where I went, nope, nope. No, I stopped at that, you know, after the psychedelics. But people have said to me that Jason Lives is like the entry level drug. You know, it's like the it marijuana. It's like, here, watch this. If you like this, you know, you can you can <laughs> go from there. You know, you know he's going to then meet Carrie and and psychokinetic stuff, and he's going to you know go to outer space. He's going and all the earlier ones. He's a little more human, and he's you know he's he you know he's much more vulnerable. And so it's like you know, or there's more sex too that they that they did. And part five before me, um, you know, that particular director came out of porn, so he there was so much you know, sex in that, that they, that they really, you know, cut a lot of it down. Um, so, you know, and I just kind of ended up going completely the other direction. Uh, not because I didn't, you know, think he did a good job or anything, but I, you know, it just wasn't me. I mean, just, as I said, I was trying to put the emphasis on the storytelling. So, uh, lots of humor, lots of great kills because, Hey, let's face it. Jason is not very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, How was the atmosphere on the set? Uh, well, as I said, we all got along so well. And I'm talking about, you know, everybody in the crew. If there was a bad guy, you know, it was the production manager. Um, because his job was every day to come to me and go, you know, that steady cam or that crane or whatever that we were supposed to have, you know, it got stuck in Atlanta. So it's not going to be here. And I kind of got used to, you know, having things kind of taken away, but it was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll figure out something else, you know, you know, which I, I always did. And eventually I began to figure out he was getting a bonus if he could bring the movie under budget. So these things that he was taking away and, you know, shortening hours on certain crew people and stuff, you know, he was probably, you know, the, the, if there was a villain, but he was also a very nice guy. I mean, he did Halloween and the fog, he, you know, he'd been doing a lot of these things, but the crew so disliked this guy that on the last day when we were doing the motorhome shot, and that was the last thing, you know, that we shot was that motorhome flying. If you look closely on the, the footage, you'll see the huge air conditioner that was on top of the motorhome suddenly fly off and go slamming down, you know, the road. He wanted that. <laughs> He asked the guys, make sure that that's really locked down. So, because I want to take that and use it for mine. And they loosened up all the bolts. So when that thing went flying, he was like, <gasps> you know, and the crew was hysterically laughing. I didn't know anything about it till literally years later. But that was their way of sort of getting back at, at the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your biggest difficulty on this film? Um, I guess just the fact that I always was running into sunlight. Uh, we were, you know, we were shooting six day weeks. So we only had Sundays off and we would, you know, literally go to sleep at like eight o'clock Sunday morning, sleep all day. And then Sunday night we would all get together and drive to a nightclub in um, Atlanta that was open all night. And we'd dance all night and hang out and stuff and then go to sleep all day morning, uh, Monday morning, and get up Monday night and keep going. So it was just kind of getting used to that strangeness. And because I was so ambitious, you know, I was fighting the sun, you know, we'd be shooting and it's like, you know, somebody that was way up on the Uh, you know, the, the big platforms they make for the, the put the lights up there, yeah. go, you know, sun's a coming, you know, like, <laughs> ah, shit, you know, and so, you know, I'm bringing in black tarps to try to like block it so I could get the last couple shots. So that was my biggest problem was God, you know, <laughs> you know, basically pulling the plug, you know, come dawn. Was it uh, cold? Oh yeah, it was yeah. very cold. And uh, yeah, you, you can kind of see it I mean, where it's most visi visible is when the, the uh, Elizabeth character goes down into that puddle of water. And if you look, that water is steaming. I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, I mean, we tried to heat it, but, you know, so it's a little more comfortable the best we could. But yeah, it, it was pretty darn cold. And any of the pictures of us, you know, we're in 
were in parkas and stuff <laughs> before cast, you know, had to be in what they were in. And and we just tried to keep them as warm and and bring in space heaters and stuff, you know, to to try to keep them, you know, so they wouldn't get sick. Was the boat scene uh, shot on set or act on the actual lake? The, the boat uh, scene was actually shot in three different locations. All the stuff that you see from a distance, um, like on the on the, uh, the the little pier that we had, and had the fire kind of around it, you know, that was at the real lake. And CJ actually walked into the real lake, you know, towards it. Then once we actually got close, and all the stuff on you know, Tom Matthews, Tommy, you know, putting the gasoline in and fighting with Jason and all that was actually done in a big Olympic swimming pool back here in Los Angeles at USC. It's like a, you know, the USC Olympic swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And we blackened, you know, all the sides of it and, you know, shot it so we could, you know, control it um, and, and did that there. Then when we got to the part where Jason's head gets, you know, chewed up, USC was not going to let us shoot there. So I called up my dad, the filmmaker, and said, "Hey, hey, hey, Dad, uh, could I like like put dunk in your pool? Because <laughs> we got to." He said, "You want to shoot here at the house?" I said, "Yeah, come on!" So he was so happy to have a whole film crew in in the backyard, and he was running around <laughs> with his little camera, taking pictures of everybody. And yeah, that's where we chopped it up, and I just had to buy him a new filter, you know, because <laughs> it got all filled with like, Jason Gook. I gotta ask: Is there a place where we can actually see those pictures? Good question. Uh, you know, I guess I mean he's passed on, but my I bet my brother might have some of those shots. Um, you know, in one of his his, his scrapbooks. Yeah, yeah. That, that's you gotta a, make no that public. That. I should look. I should look <laughs> that up and see if he, see if he does have those. That would be so great. So you shot three different endings for Jason Lives. Uh, what was the endings? Well, the, the, there was always going to be, for me, obviously, the Jason's father, which we couldn't do. And as a result, um, you know, the caretaker now I could kill. So we ended up, you know, adding that sequence where, you know, he gets the bottle mashed into him. and Which so has that, the same name as me, if, I'm, uh, if I remember yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't like they were, I mean, the ending was still basically the same thing, you know. It you know it's it's finally over and the little light little flame goes out on the on the lake and then you know there was going to be um, you know moving in you know towards the water like you know maybe it's over over and then we cut to the cemetery when we we're going to meet his father so we didn't have that but I shot a, another kind of a false little thing with the deputy who was still in the jail cell where Tommy had left him. And it's sort of like a, you know, now they would have put it at the very, very end after the credits and everybody is out of the theater practically, you know, it's, you know, where you put the last little button. And so, yeah, uh, Vinny, who played uh, that, that deputy, um, he is yelling and, you know, and stuff, and he's trying to get the key and, and it can't reach it. And then a, you hear a door open and it's like, oh, good. And then he looks and then he starts to back away. And you, you and you don't know what he's seeing, but you pretty much guess, you know, oh, Jason yeah. has gotten out of the water. Um, so that never ended up going in, other than I think it's in a TV version in some some weird place. Uh, but the actual thing was still to go in, you know, on that mask and see his eye, you know, that he's chained down there, but he ain't dead. So and I and that was to me a big thing that. Anytime anybody goes to a lake, it's like, you know, what if someone like Jason was like chained down there just waiting for somebody to, to go, go swimming? And there's been like, I think, three or four lakes that actually made like a stone Jason and put him down there with a chain <laughs> holding him. And he's all covered in, you know, moss and, 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 and algae and stuff. And you've got to be like a deep sea diver pretty much to go down and take pictures. But That was like the greatest compliment for me to take that image that I came up with and see somebody actually make it and have it out there. Did you ever thought that uh, somebody somewhere uh, would create a little figurine that goes in uh, the fish's aquarium? I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's one of the greatest invention ever. So you have written a new Friday the 13th. Are we hoping to get you back to directing a new film for the franchise? 
that's my hope. Um, I, I wrote it finally. Uh, it only took me 33 years to finally come up with a couple of ideas that I felt if I could merge these two things together, you know, I think I have something that a I would want to see as a horror and a Friday fan. And I would hope that the audience would as well. And having talked to so many people over the years and they're all going, you know, you've got to do another one, man. You got to do another one. And I said, well, Frank wanted me to do part seven. I didn't have any more ideas at that time. I went, you know, I don't, I don't know what I would do at this point to, to take it another step, you know, you know, and then he, then he offered up, how about if Jason and Freddie meet? And I, well, you can't do that. He's with New Line. He goes, well, we're going to try. Well, it didn't work. You know, he came back to me and he said, you got any other ideas? And I said, well, Paramount owns Cheech and Chong. What about if they meet Jason? And he goes, you kidding? I go, <laughs> <laughs> like I bought the Costello. Yeah. And, you know, he laughed and then he said, no, I don't think that same audience would like it. And I said, are you kidding? All these people smoke the same dope. You know, they all get drink, drunk. They would love it. You know, it's like, yeah, Jason's out there, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, you know, make them camp counselors or make them guys out, you know, camping. But, you know, that idea didn't fly. So after all these years, I started realizing, you know what? We've never had like Jason in the snow, Jason in a winter setting. And of course, usually people go, well, it's a summer camp. So why would there be one? And then I thought, well, what would, put, what would bring people out during the winter that made sense? And of course, a ski resort, which to me was just not that interesting. And the kind of characters that were there would just be sort of set up to be killed. But then with my Catholic background, I thought, what if it was a spiritual retreat? What if these were teenage Catholic girls who are badass girls, you know, they are tough as nails. They are being taken by this Irish nun to this spiritual retreat over the Thanksgiving Day weekend, you know, with the intention of she's going to try to get them to, you know, redeem themselves, you know, spiritually. And of course, they have no interest in that happening. And, you know, and they do kind of, at a, you know, I mean, the nun is like the in the beginning, the villain in the piece to the girls. And then they they screw with her in a way that's very funny what they end up doing. And of course, Jason now comes up through the ice. And so the whole place, you know, my, my thought was like John Carpenter's The Thing, where you are snowed in. You, you know, you, there's no real place to go. If you run, he's going to see your footprints, walk, go right after oh, you. Oh, so true. And the lake would be completely, you know, frozen over. So instead of, you know having anybody, you know, uh, take a boat across, you know, one of the victims can actually try to run. And of course, they're going to be, you know, doing all the typical horror stuff of slipping and stuff, but for a good reason. And Jason just sure-footed is coming right after him. So I've added a lot of things that, you know, you've never actually seen before, you know, in a Friday. And I've tried to, like, take some element from my one, because I'm setting this in 1919, so that just before, you know, we, we turn over to 2000, you guys are probably too young, but, you know, all of us were so scared that the world was going to end. All the prophets were saying, so as it turned, <laughs> you know, all the clocks, everything was going to go. So for the kids, they didn't give a fuck. I mean, they, they, care. they care about that. But just whenever you say, you know, like, like, like Prince, you know, we're going to party like it's 1999. I mean, there was always something about that. And I thought, well... At, in the 90s, people still dressed a lot like the 80s, so I could maintain that look and that feeling because fans really don't like when it becomes modern day and, and everybody has cell phones and stuff. I wanted to have a bit of that, you know, old school respect, but literally make it happen 13 years from when I put him down in the lake. Now he's going to come, you know, up in a very theatrical way um, that's going to be expensive. So it can't be like a little fan film. So I'm going to need it to be like, you know, a studio type film. So I'm sitting here waiting for these guys to work out their differences. Um, you know, Victor Miller, who wrote the thing and, and the original one and Sean Cunningham. And now Victor has won. So he can make a movie called Friday the 13th and he can remake his original, but he can't use a hockey mask jason sean can use the hockey mask jason he can call it you know j 
Jason goes to Paris, anything he wants, but he can't call it Friday the 13th. So, you know, that was the big battle that was going on. Now these two guys, you know, if somebody wants to make Friday the 13th and Jason, they've got to work out some sort of financial thing. Um, and I think Victor's can't go to Europe, but Sean can do it in Europe, but he can't do it in America. I mean, there's all these stipulations. So I don't know where that puts me other than in mine, I never have to say Friday the 13th, although I do suggest when, when this event first starts, um, but it's just Jason, you know, it's just, I would have to make sure that I have the rights to do Jason. Is uh, the working title still Jason Never Dies? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, what could we do to make that happen? I mean, I can already picture a couple sliding on a hill and get decapitated. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've tried to give him some new toys, um, you know, being out there. You know, he, he does find a, um, a shed that has a bunch of like gardening and landscaping things. So there are some some new weapons that he does find and then there's some stuff that is kind of unique to the fact that you're in a frozen you know area um and there's new places for him to not be seen because of the heavy snow and things so there's a lot that i i've played with to, to give it some surprises and i just felt like the more claustrophobic it is the better you know that it really puts them in a a much more impossible way to escape And it, at a certain point, it's got to be, you know, this woman and him, you know, or this girl and him and, you know, and, and there's no other men in the entire movie. It's, and it's not that I'm doing that for, you know, political, you know, nice guy reasons. It's like, no, it's a nun and Catholic schoolgirl. So, and Jason, so that, that's it. I mean, that's, that's what the story is. And blood on snow always looks good. <laughs> oh, yeah. A few years ago, you were offered a script called a scary movie which yes. was actually Scream. <laughs> Why didn't you direct the movie? I'll be absolutely honest. I read the script and from the first scene, I went, I sort of did this already. You know, I sort of already kind of made fun of the slasher genre. Um, but let me, let me keep reading, you know, and I thought, well, you know, it's good. And I like the twist and, you know, the script I read as called Scary Movie was pretty much note for note what scream was so i said you know i just don't want to you know copy myself in the same way i turned down bride of chucky because it's like i didn't want to do another franchise movie and the first movie i was offered after i did jason lives was nightmare on elm street 4 which i went in to meet on it and i said uh well i would love to do a freddy movie um you know when do you start oh we already started I mean you already started oh yeah no we've got two other units already shooting i said and you don't have a director no 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 we know how to do these things and i went i'm not going to have any freedom <laughs> you know these guys are going to be running the ship without me but rennie harlan was smart enough to take the job and you know he went on to have a very good career um so sometimes you you know you don't know where something's going to turn but i i said you know To my agent what other scripts did, do you have besides this let me put this aside for a moment and i read all these other ones and i kind of you know after a couple months i you know i said you know what of all the scripts you know kevin williamson's scream one was at least the best written and stuff and he goes that eh, too late wes craven's got it i went oh okay here's the great irony maybe 10 15 years later i meet with kevin williamson and i said you know i got a have a confession, you know, I turned down scary movie, you know, when I first read it, because I thought it was too close to what I did. And he says, well, I got a confession too. Your Friday the 13th had a lot to do with why I wrote oh, really? the movie. So that was a, you know, huge compliment, but at the same time, like, you know, what an idiot. I mean, <laughs> Uh, let's go back to the music. Alice Cooper perform He's Back, The Man Behind the Mask. This music is just amazing and fits so well to the movie. Yeah. Uh, is it one of your ideas to have Alice Cooper? I assume that it is because you've been talking about uh, Alice Cooper a few minutes ago. So, Yeah, well, two, two good stories about that. One was that because I'm a rock and roll guy, the, the soundtrack, you know, you do it when you 
put together your director's cut, you part, you borrow all the best movie music and songs that you can get the things you love, you think would be great. You know, you're not going to get them because they're going to be too expensive, but you know, John Williams has got the score, you know, and, you know, and I had ACDC and Alice and Metallica and all these other, you know, bands and their songs in there. And I turned it into Frank Mancuso and, you know, he said, you know, he really liked it. You know, the notes were so minimal it wasn't even, you know, and it's like, you don't even have to do this, but you're here and here. And of course, you know, being a good director to his producer, it's like anything I could fix that made him happier, I did. But he said, um, what do you think about Alice Cooper doing a song for this? I said, are you kidding me? He goes, no, his company now, Alice is kind of in a slump right now um, with their record sales and stuff. And, you know, he, his, you know, manager loves this idea of Alice doing the song for the movie. And I went, here's the other bizarre thing, Frank. When I was up and coming as a, as a rock and roller in the mid 60s, I opened, or they, we opened for each other, um, this group called the Naz. And I would hang out at Frank Zappa's house with all these other young rock and rollers. We were all just around the same age. And the lead singer of the Naz was a guy named Vincent, who, you know, lived in Texas. And years later, I went, holy shit, that's Alice and Vincent. And so there's, he, here we are 35 years later, since he's done the song. The last time I saw Alice slash Vincent was back in 1966. We still have not, you know, had like a photo shoot together or, you know, talk to each other, but we talk about things all the time. And in my show, you know, I do, you know, band behind the mask. Some fan told Alice and he goes, yeah, I got to have him up on stage sometime and we got to do it together. So I'm waiting, you know, for, <laughs> for that bucket list thing in my life to actually be able to do the song, you know, with him. So, yeah, it's, it's so strange that we actually, you know, were together way back when and then this just kind of happened you know out of a fluke and after he wrote the song I said can we get a couple more songs they go yeah which ones do you like and I went Teenage Frankenstein Hard yeah. Rock Summer and you know I was happy uh, speaking of music Harry Manfredini completely changed his style for Jason Lives and yeah. again I'm not being uh, you know the, the crazy fan there but it's my favorite soundtrack Uh, why did you decide to change style of music with Ari? Did you add anything to do with it? Oh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, I really did not want Harry to do the same score. And he goes, you know, you know, because he's, you know, he's a really good musician and, and composer. And he goes, Frank wants, this is what it is. This is the signature. This is, you know. And I said, you know, Harry, there's got to be a way. I'm going really gothic horror. In fact, you know, if you turn off the color and watch my movie in black and white, it looks really fucking good because I'm imitating that high contrasty look of the universal movies. So I want a score that somehow, yes, you got to have <laughs> and you got to have, you know, all the, you know, horn instruments and everything else in there. But can't we get it to have much more of a kind of a almost religious or gothic? And then he said, yes, there's a classical piece I can weave in. Um, which is in Latin, and for the moment, I can't think of what it's actually called, but it's a very identifiable, you know, church, gothic, you know, uh, piece of music. So when he started to play that, I went, that's it, that's great. So that there's that underneath all the Friday stuff is this, you know, the dead are back, you know, it had that gothic undertone. Still, to this day, Harry, you know, goes on about how it's his favorite score, because You know, I took away something that you could just sort of, you know, do by rote and yep. said, you know, you got, you can't do that. Got to do something else. And he did. And he really rose to the occasion. And to me, all, all artists, you know, that's where you really get the shine when they say, well, you can't have that. You're only going to do this much. You can only get this much money or only got this much time that you go, all right, screw it. Let me figure out how to do it. And those restrictions, lots of times end up, you, you know, you, you, get some sort of inspiration, you know, and, it, and it's so much better. And yeah, his score is just terrific. And I see on all these fan films, they're always using that in their, you know, their little Fridays that they make, which is you know, another high compliment. 
we we met Eric like a few years ago and had an interview with this guy. He's such a nice guy too. Oh, yeah. Not only yeah. talent, but he's very nice. Uh, uh, you wanted to know if you got any directives uh, from the production uh, about Jason or the uh, the crew itself. The crew about it. Well, was there any specific direction? Did uh, the production house said, uh, okay, you got to do this, 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 or you add entirely uh, creative uh, creative choice? Um, this was probably, well, actually the movie that followed this, uh, Date with an Angel uh, with Emmanuel Bayard. Um, you know, I, I, I went after the biggest star in <laughs> Europe, you know, when I went after Emmanuel and, you know, you know, they had my Jason posters were, were all up and down the Champs-Élysées as, and, and was her picture of Manon de Source. <laughs> uh, so for Date with an Angel, I wanted her for my angel. Um, and I had, you know, pretty much total creative freedom on that until we finished the movie and Dino De Laurentiis company was falling apart and then they started cutting and changing things. But with Friday, they were in a position where they needed to get their audience back and he trusted me. So I really got to be the auteur, totally in the classic, you know, tradition. I mean, one of my heroes is Francois Truffaut because, you know, he could take a little bit of money and character and make these movies that I always thought were wonderful. And, you know, that's kind of, as a filmmaker, what I've always wanted to do. You write something, you know what you need, you get the right people, they support it, and, you know, you, you go and do it. And the, the only place that we ran into problems is the motion picture rating board, because they had to cut certain things in our kills just because they had to do it. <laughs> you know, that was their job. And the one Thing that they picked on more than anything else, the one I had to keep going back and taking a few more frames and a few more frames, was the scene where the sheriff gets bent backwards <laughs> by Jason. I was expecting that. No drop of blood, you know, nothing, not, no gore, nothing, just the idea and the sound effect, you know, that happened, <laughs> right? And they, it drove them crazy. It just, it's like, no, 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 that's too much. And I'm going, you know, and I'm fighting, going, you know, how can you say that? And they go, well, it's cumulative. By the time we get to that kill, you know, we've seen just too much and, 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 and we can't take it, you know. So, you know, I, I had to do, you know, some more little trims, but it didn't ruin the sequence, you know. Not at all. Um, you know, it's one so of the it, best scenes. <laughs> and that's, that's an old gag. That's an old comedy gag that I did with Dick Van Dyke um, years before. Uh, it was a sketch called The Chiropractor. And this chiropractor, played by Tommy Smothers from the Smothers Brothers, ap you know, accidentally knocks him off the table. And then he goes down with his assistant and he takes Dick Van Dyke's leg and puts it past his head, you know, and, and bends him, you know. And, you know, of course, we had, you know, two, one actor playing the legs and the other. So I did the same comic effect, except with Jason, it was horrible as opposed to funny. <laughs> Stole from my time. If you had to make a choice, would you choose uh, filmmaking or music? Um, that's such a difficult question. Um, <laughs> when I'm on stage, uh, singing and performing and going into the audience and you know holding people or. You know, I, I slide across the floor. I have these pads on my knees so I can slide and go right up to people. And I, you know, I do all these, you know, I have fire come out of my hands and, and did all this stuff. That excitement with an audience and seeing them go, oh, and you're right there to feel that. I mean, that's amazing. And yet I must, you know, I want to make movies because I love creating something that lives beyond that moment when you're on stage that's it it's over you know the people are there they see it that's it and i had a um a french teacher uh etienne de Cru, who once said that you know to have you know a, a good movie or a good presentation it is like you know a, a good wine you you have to have obviously the right grapes and stuff for the taste 
and things, but you need also the alcohol, the liqueur to relax you, you know, and you enjoy the taste and you enjoy what it does to you. So music is that that liqueur, that alcohol, you know, the visual is the grapes and things. And it's sort of like the two things together to me, you know, and, and of course, only the French could make such a beautiful comparison <laughs> to that. Um, Americans wouldn't get it. But, you know, that to me is is kind of like, I don't know if I could just say, oh, I'm only going to do music because it's not so much recording or being in the studio because you're, you know, you're not participating with the crowd, but to write something and then to see it come alive with 80 other people and you're all, you know, going for the same objective of trying to make something really good. And sometimes you don't, <laughs> sometimes you do. And it's, uh, you know, if we all knew how to do it, like a formula, every movie would be a hit. Every song would be great. You know, it's like, you don't know, you know, you, you, you can't repeat what you did before. You have to try something different. So both things are just so, you know, in integral to me. It, it would be very hard, you know, to choose. I guess if I go blind, I'll be doing music. <laughs> <laughs> and if I go deaf, I'll be only be making movies. So. I think John Carpenter is one of the greatest example of uh, music and movies going and and and. Uh, guys, more questions? Yes. Uh, Demande-lui, est-ce que le cauchemar de Nancy uh, fait référence à Freddy Krueger? Oh, in Nightmare on M Street. Uh, would... Okay. Would Nancy's nightmares uh, make reference to a Nightmare on M Street, is that? Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, uh, no. Um, the, the little girl was named Nancy, actually, after my ex-wife, Nancy. Okay. Um, but um, the little girl, uh, for me, represents something that when she meets Jason, that's the beginning of another story um, that I'm, that's part of what I'm planning to do at some point. So she fits in, you know, in a, in a much kind of, you know, bigger scheme. But I didn't know at the time if I was ever going to have that happen because we all thought that these movies were only going to play two weeks and then you're never going to see them again. They're, they're gone. You know, the film will rot, <laughs> you know, in a vault. And that would be that. So now there's those opportunities, you know, to, to do things like that. And, you know, maybe I have to do that story about the little girl as a, you know, film fan, get people to, you know, fund it and, and do it that way. I'm not sure. But before I die, you know, before we get to 2050, which is, My, my You're date. only 17, Tom. You're only yes, 17. <laughs> exactly. But I, I, one way or the other, I, you know, I'd love to, you know, leave that behind um, is one of the things where people go, oh, that's what that meant. Okay. Because I get questioned about that a lot. Yeah. How did you get uh, on to Project Black Hole? The Black Hole. Uh, the Black Hole, Walt, sorry. Yeah. The, the Walt Disney Black Hole was yes. a job that, because I was a mime, Um, I was called and they said, we want you to direct the, the robots, the sentries and the humanoids who are going to kind of float that are in that. And I went, okay, you know, so it was a job. It was down the street at the Disney studios. And then when I was doing it, the director, Gary Nelson said, I really like the way you move we're going to write a character for you in the movie, which was Captain Star. So they wrote a whole sequence in which I was in a black robot costume. And we had a shooting gallery situation with the two little robots. So that, you know, that kind of just came out of you know, what the director wanted to do. Uh, we never thought the movie was going to be very successful because it wasn't Star Wars. You know, it was very kind of slow and John Williams score, you know, da, 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 you know, we didn't, but now all these years later, there, it has a large fan base. There's so many people that just love it because they saw it when they were a little kid and they, you know, they, they loved the, the, the movie and the characters in the movie. Um, I love that I met Robert Forrester, the lead, 
because I told him one day I'm going to be a director and one day I'm going to work with you. And sure enough, I don't know, 20 years later, I was doing a movie called Murder in Greenwich and, you know, I got Robert Forrester in it. And I said, remember, I told you I was going to do that. So that was one of the best things that kind of came out of the movie for me. It's funny because Disney uh, tried to do something like Star Wars with Black Hole and then it didn't work out as they wanted to. So they decided to buy Star Wars. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, we all, we all found that very humorous. But George kept his name up there, though. George yeah. Lucas, Star Wars. Understandable. So a lot of fans says that uh, Jason Lives is part of the three best Friday the 13. How do you feel about this? I'm very complimented. Um, there, you know, for me, part four is the best because to me, that to me, for a Friday movie where the Jason was really good, I liked the characters, you know, it was, it was fun and it kind of seemed like it ended, you know, that it was over, that they weren't kind of going, oh, he's coming back. All the things I thought Joe Zito, the director, did a really, you know, good job with that. Uh, so that was my favorite. Um, and then the first one is completely kind of separate because it, you know, when that, when that movie ended, um, originally, you know, it was Tina, I think, what's her name? Tina, the, uh, uh, Adrian, uh, King's character, I think it was named Tina, you know, fights with Mrs. Voorhees and, you know, cuts off her head. And the last shot of the movie was the police coming and here's, you know, Tina on the ground, you know, holding Mrs. Voorhees' head. And you can look in her eyes and you go, uh-oh, you know, she's going to be crazy like Mrs. Voorhees. And then they came up with this idea because of Carrie. No, we got to have a big jump scare. We got to have like, you know, Her Carrie's hand coming up. Um, so they, you know, created young Jason, you know, coming out of the, out of the water. And then, it, you know, when they, it was so big, they went, well, We killed the mother. We got a little boy. It can't be about a little boy killing. So then they jumped, obviously, to the man with the elephant man mask over him, and uh, you know they carried on. So it it the fans over the years, you know, I I made the best movie I could make with what I had. When people say yours is the best, I go, I am so complimented, you know, because it you know to me I did what I had to do. But at the same time, I didn't expect people to like the humor. I thought a lot of that wasn't going to work because, as I said, part four to me didn't have all that. And, it, and I thought that's what the fans wanted to see because I didn't want to see part five. Um, so whenever they do these polls and if I'm number one, as been happening a lot recently, it's like, you know, I can't believe that, you know, but usually it's somewhere in the, in the top three you know, the first one or the fourth one. And, and there's some people that like Jason goes to hell because it's so unlike any of the other ones. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's hard to have an opinion when it's, you know, you're kind of part of that, that whole world. Well, Jason lives. I said it, it's the best one ever. <laughs> uh, why did you decide to uh, direct? Uh, well, it's been a while since you directed a, a movie. Is there a re any reason why? Yes. Um, I, I hit a wall. Um, I had done a movie that I, I really loved um, in 19... God, when was it? Uh, no, not 19. It was like uh, 2009, I think it was, um, called The Wronged Man. And I cast uh, Mahershala Ali as the lead. Of course, now he's like won what two Oscars? I mean, Mahershala, you know, is is huge, huge actor, and I, you know, I had him right in the very beginning of his career, and also Julia Armand, um, who also was like, I fell in love with her in all those movies, you know, that that she was in in the beginning of her career, and we shot it down south, and it was a very, you know, black themed movie about. Herschel's character going into prison and it had you know I was able to write the dialogue you know with the black dialect which I loved doing I loved you know it was as Obama 
was was you know coming into office i mean it all like i felt like i was really doing movies and doing something that i really cared about at the same time and then the next offer was two movies to shoot at the same time um for the author patricia cornwell um who had done you know these these um oh god what was their name the, the main character she had uh, Sc Scapetta, Scapera, Scapetta. She did a whole bunch of, I mean, she's sold more books than Stephen King has with the, her characters and stuff. And she wrote these, these two stories for the London Times and the New York Times, and they weren't very good. And they did scripts and the scripts were not very good. But I had, you know, agent, manager, family all going, no, you should do this. this you, can, you can make two movies at the same time, basically the same cast, you know, you're going to get paid, you know, all the, and I'm, and I'm going, I, I don't know. I, you know, I just don't feel good about it, but I did it. And the second I started, you know, when I went to t Toronto to shoot, it was like, I sold my soul. It was like, <laughs> like something just went dark in me. And through the whole process, I sat in the director's chair. I, I was there, but I totally wasn't there. And I realized I can't do this. I cannot, you know, I, I can't just make product. I can't, you know, and it really kind of stopped me. And I said, I'm not, I'm not directing for a while. I, I, I have to find myself again and things. And then the band came in. I mean, literally a year later, suddenly it was like here. And I went, wow, I, that was my dream when I was 16 years old. I, I never thought I was going to get a chance to do that again. So everything shifted, you know, into that, but I couldn't stop writing. I couldn't stop, you know, dreaming. I couldn't stop like, you know, teaching film to young up and coming filmmakers because I want to see them do things new and fresh and think. So it's like, I've, I've not quit, but I have to find, you know, the right vehicle to do it. And when I finally started to have the scripts ready to go two years ago, COVID, <laughs> stop again not so you know so it's not that i don't want to do it it's just purely because it's just you know i'm in a place now where you know i'm an older filmmaker uh you know dare i say i'm a white male um things have really changed in terms of the pressure of you know that the studios have to hire you know people of different ethnicities and women and things which i'm totally in favor of i think that's really important but basically you know there still is this pressure that they have to meet now quotas you know do we have enough of you know, each type of ethnicity you know do we have enough women doing these part of stuff and so that's kind of how they're making movies in a, in, in a way now um, yeah. because there's these new rules so it makes my job twice as hard to get a job <laughs> But I'm not afraid of that, you know, in that if I didn't, you know, if I never got a chance again, you know, I've had some wonderful things, you know, the book that they did on my life, uh, uh, you know, A Strange Idea of Entertainment has, you know, so many wonderful stories and stuff, but I'm not over. I mean, for me, it's like, it's not over till that coffin lid closes. And even then I have plans for, you know, if you go to my crypt, you know, I am fixing this so that you will have an experience so that even though I'm gone in body, I will not be there. You know, I will not be gone in energy and very much like what I talked about in one dark night, I'm going to test out for myself. So I want to be a psychic energy, you know, that people can say, you know what, there, there is something more than just what you can do on a phone. You know, we can do stuff that we've never done or done it as a scientific, you know, three times, test get the same result three times that makes it a science so i mean because i believe in ghosts i believe in these entities and all this stuff we just can't you know make it happen when we want it to happen it happens for certain people at certain times and other people never happen so so that there, there's you know for me it's like i i, I really don't want to leave on having directed you know <laughs> these last two things that i did you know 10 years ago and i was actually um Four months ago, in Florida, I had written a script called The Hanging Tree. Um, the, uh, the, the creator of the Blair Witch Project 
um, Dan Merrick was producing it. We were on location. I cast it. I had my crew. We were literally 48 hours, two days away from me saying action. And the owner of the plantation where we were shooting, because it was like an old 1850s plantation, he found out that the story I was doing was anti-racist, that, that the, the, you know, the theme of it was obviously that, that there was something that had happened here years ago, which it did. The plantation had 6,000 slaves on it, you know, through history. Um, he went, nope, I'm not letting you on the property. And he broke the contract, put us all on plane, and back we came. And I was like, I've done 42 films. I've never had a movie shut down just before I was about to do it. You know, I had a movie where I had Marlon Brando and just before you know, we went up, started <laughs> ready. And then Brando went, I don't think I want to do this. No, you know, and, <laughs> out. and then I got Donald Sutherland, who was great. So it all worked out. But yeah, to actually be stopped over the fact that I was doing something that was, you know, anti-racist but very subtly very you know it was like it's it's like a uh, I mean because it was a horror thing and it was like a kind of a fable and a choice that this girl has to make about whether she's going to hold on to it or not and I had this incredible 12 year old uh black uh boy who was hung you know like back in the 40s and he's like the thing that pursues her you know, down the hall, you know, with the role. I mean, it looked great, guys. I mean, <laughs> it was going to be scary. And the, the fact that it was stopped, I'm hoping, you know, somehow, you know, we can we can get back to it again. But, you know, they spent so much money on the pre-production that now it's like, all right, they got to, you know, get more funding for it to happen. Um, who knows? You may be uh, going back on Jason Never Dies. Hopefully. <laughs> Well, uh, we're done, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you very much. It was an honor for us. Uh, keep doing a great job, musical or even making movies. We want to see everything and hear everything from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very it. Thank much. You. And it was Thank enjoyable. You. Thank, Thank you. you all. It was, it was Thank great. You.